uh, in their life. May I just know if anybody is taking their family with them, if they have uh, children going? Anybody taking their family with them? No children. children? No, no children. children. Okay, excellent. If I can just uh, use this. Yeah. Can you hear me? So I'd like to also thank Brother Bashir Mustafa for having given me this privilege of uh, addressing you, albeit at such short notice. This is not the end of my talk. I thought that I would just muster together some thoughts and then try to make this a value-based talk for you and see how best you could kind of achieve maximum spiritual benefit through a proper physical approach of being sound in mind and in body. So actually, if you feel that you're starting your preparations now, you're already rather late. Because what happens is, when you are planning to go on international travel, especially for uh, you know, a very marathon event like uh, Hajj, what happens is you should have at least started this one and a half months before in terms of health. So I'm focusing on health. The reason why I say this is because what happens is you will have to make sure that your immune systems are at par with all the diseases that you may encounter when you go for Hajj. So as a first step, what I would say is that because different people have different health conditions, the first thing that they should do is to go to their doctor and make sure that all their medical conditions are stable. For example, if someone has diabetes, someone has hypertension, someone has you know, cardiac murmurs and palpitations, you have to make sure that all those conditions are stable because what happens is under trying conditions, under stress, all these conditions get exacerbated, they get worsened. So the most important thing is that you have to have a good checkup and have investigations done to make sure that everything is stable and if anything needs to be fixed, for example, if you need to be changing your diabetes medications or your antihypertensive drugs or let's say some other medications that need to be, uh, you know, titrated for you to have better control, that would be the time to do it. The second thing is also to make sure that you're physically fit because the Hajj is a very trying event if you want to do it the right way. So you want to make sure that you're physically fit. And the third most important thing is a very, very accurate immunization review. The reason for this is that you wouldn't want to be paying such a lot traveling to Saudi Arabia with mixing with so many people from different countries, bringing along different bacterial and viral patterns with them, and then having to, uh, you know, stand, withstand all those trying, uh, you know, trying conditions. So at the least you would want to at least get tested for measles, mumps and rubella antibody titers, measles being the most important. And then you would also want to be tested for your hepatitis B, hepatitis A antibody titers. And last but not the least is you just want to make sure that you, you're not uh, you know, you don't need any other vaccines, for example, uh, the meningitis vaccine, because that is mandatory when you, uh, when you kind of go to Saudi Arabia, because there is a special strain called the ACYD531 strain that you may need, and that is extremely important. It's very, it's very, very specific to countries like Saudi Arabia. So this is something that, that you want to kind of do. Now, having said that, a good physical examination before you set forth for Hajj would be a very good, uh, you know, smart idea so that you know what's going on and you, you, if you have, let's say, for example, mild arthritis that could be exacerbated when you do so much of walking, you just want to make sure you, you kind of get it looked at, maybe an intra-articular steroid or, or something else or physiotherapy and, and uh, things like that. Now, having said that, let's try to focus on a day like this where you are about a week or two away from the Hajj. I think it's starting on the 9th or to the 14th, but then I'm sure that you're going to leave pretty early. So this is something which is very important. And how would you want to prepare for that? So the most important thing is that 
make sure that you buy travel insurance along with your ticket. It's extremely, extremely important that you buy travel insurance because if you have any medical condition that you did not, uh, that you did not apprehend or you did not expect, it would be in your best interest to make sure that you're insured in case you have to go to major hospitals over there. The second most important thing is prepare an ID card with your name, where you stay and everything else. And on that ID card, make sure that you have all your medical conditions that are specified so that if someone finds you at some place, they know at least your medical conditions. And last but not the least, also have a list of all your medications. A list of all your medications is a must. And whilst you are compiling a list of your medications, a very important feature would be a prescription from your qualified doctor so that what happens is you're not stopped and then you are not endang endangering the safety of the other people's pilgrimage. Because there are certain medications that Saudi frowns upon, especially narcotics, but you may be requiring them for pain. For example, codeine and opioids and other opioids and things like that. So make sure that you have a valid prescription. So this is something that uh, I, would, uh, I would say would be extremely, extremely uh, important. And depending upon your health conditions, make sure that you have appropriate paraphernalia. For example, if you are known to have diabetes, you would want to make sure that you get adequate stocks of your blood glucose strips and also your blood glucose monitor. If you have high blood pressure issues, it won't hurt you when you're packing so much and so many clothes and everything else to pack a very smart blood pressure machine that you're used to well in advance, you know how to monitor that because not always will you have help right at your bedside. Everybody's busy, everybody's organizing, and then they have to be in charge of the whole group. So it is best that you take your health in your hands and then look after at least the needs of your family members in a very pragmatic way. For example, let's say someone's feeling a little dizzy, someone's feeling a little tired. So the first thing that you'll do is measure their blood pressure, give them water, and also make sure that you've measured their blood glucose. Just, just to give you an example. And then what's very important is also to know what is prevalent over there at this time of the year. When you are indulging in international travel, what is it that is prevalent over there at this time of the year? Because you wouldn't want to meander into Saudi Arabia like Alice in Wonderland. Because that could be extremely naive on your part and you do not want to get stuck. So some of the things that have come to the fore now in Saudi Arabia have been an outbreak of measles. As in Canada now, as is in Canada, there has been an outbreak of measles. So the other thing is known as the Mid-Eastern Respiratory uh, Viral Syndrome. So this is something which is very important. So you ought to be aware of this. So if you have not taken your measles vaccine, at least try to go and get your blood work done to see if you have got measles antibody titers because this is a vaccine that you may have taken well as, as you were growing up. So if you are appropriately protected, you don't need it. But if you have low antibody titers, as an adult, you will need two doses and these two doses have to be taken at least 28 days apart so that you have appropriate antibody titers when you set forth on Hajj. So this is something which is very important in Saudi Arabia at this point in time. The, others, uh, the other is meningitis and I'm sure that all of you are getting immunized with the specific conjugated uh, uh, vaccine called the ACYWD strain that I was just talking to you about. The third most important thing is that you want to be careful that you're at least immunized against typhoid because these are foodborne diseases. You know, you're going to be eating out in the open, you're going to be drinking water at different spots and then there is so many kind of, uh, you know, journeys that you'll have to make within this big journey. You'll have to have many journeys. For example, as soon as you get down, you have to go to Mina and then you have to come back. You have to go to Arafah, you have to go to Musdalifa, then you have to come back to Mina and then maybe what you'll have to do is some of you may also want to go to Medina. So there is a lot of movement and remember that you are not cocooned. 
You're not kind of, you are not in an air bubble. You're mixing with different people coming with, from different backgrounds, different age groups and different immune systems and they already have health conditions. So you've got to be extremely, extremely, extremely careful. So this is the reason why you have to guard against these diseases, water and foodborne diseases. So I was talking to you about measles. I spoke to you about typhoid. I spoke to you about meningitis. The other thing that I would like to just touch upon would be traveler's diarrhea. Extremely important because what happens is once you get dehydrated, you're just going to uh, forsake the safety of your entire group because everybody you shake hands with may get infected because it spreads by the fecal oral route. You shake hands like this and you know, they just without washing hands go and eat something, you've infected him. So this is something which is very important. Traveler's diarrhea would be uh, one very important thing that I would like to focus on and there's a vaccine for that. So lucky for you, what happens is there's another bad condition called, another bad uh, condition when we travel, malaria. Usually what happens is the holy cities of Mecca, the holy city of Medina, Jeddah and Riyadh are exempt. They don't have this mosquito menace over there. But if you go somewhere meandering to Jizan and things like that, you could have malaria. So what happens is if you're planning to go after, I mean, after your Hajj, some people try to, you know, visit other parts of Saudi Arabia, make sure that you have an anti-malarial prophylaxis. And the way you do that is that three days before you leave, you start an anti-malaria pill and you keep taking one every day and you keep taking that until you're there for Hajj and you also take it until seven days after you return because you do not want to get back those infected gametes to Canada and then infect those around you. So you do that. But to just make matters very easy for you, if you're just sticking with Brother Bashir to go to Mecca, Medina, and then back doing the Hajj and then coming back, then you don't actually need to be on the malaria pill, unless of course you're camping at Mina and then there are mosquitoes over there. So this is something that you will you'll you'll have to be very careful of, careful about. So as I speak to you, I'm just going to keep on summarizing things because my, my, my objective is not just to give a talk and run away. My objective is to actually visualize what you're going to face during the, the struggle and the strife of Hajj and make sure that you come back home safely. So my aim is to educate, to empathize and educate and make sure that each one of you is concerned not only about yourself but those around you because you can only achieve this as a group. Because the moment one, of, or one or two of you fall sick, the whole group is kind of compromised. So this is something which is very important. So as I was telling you, get a good health check, get your blood work kind of uh, smartened, and make sure that all of you have all your medication lists updated. Have an ID card with your name, your age, where, where you come from, all your medical conditions, don't forget the blood group over there in case of an emergency. So don't forget your blood group. So this is something that you want to do. And then what happens is make sure that very well before you leave, you have some physical and meditation exercises because it's going to be a very uh, trying ordeal. Though it may just be for about five days, it's just going to be a very trying ordeal if you want to do it right. If you're just going to sit in the hotel room, watch TV and then shout out Allahumma Labbaik uh, sporadically and then say it was a fantastic Hajj, Brother Bashir arranged for fantastic rooms, beautiful view and then what happens, lovely food and then what lovely people and then you're coming back with gold in your pocket, that's your option. But for those people who want to do Hajj the way it is ordained, then you will have to be extremely smart, you'll have to run it like a marathon and that is what I'm trying to focus on over here today. So luckily you're not taking children, otherwise we would have meandered a little and then we would have included what children need. So I spoke also about measles being very common there, the MERS kind of uh, syndrome that's going to be there. I spoke about typhoid, I spoke about malaria, I spoke to you about traveler's uh, uh, diarrhea and then respiratory infections. So what happens is, I mean, I love this Arab custom, but you'll have to be very careful. Like you jump and kiss everybody on the cheeks and then you say, other things, right? Be very careful because what happens is if you are within coughing, talking, laughing and sneezing distance of people who are infected, the most important kind of a respiratory infection that you may kind of get is a viral pharyngitis. 
So this could be uh, a strep throat as we usually call it, but a strep throat, uh, a, strep, a streptococcal sore throat is a, is a bacterial pharyngitis. You may also get a virus. So just make sure that you stay very clear of people and then be respectful of uh, other people's health, ne health needs if you have uh, if you if you if you have a respiratory infection because what people do as we see in Taravi over here is that they go down and then when the bulgum or the sputum comes to your chest the first thing they do is to cough on the carpet and the poor guy who comes and prays after them gets it full blast in his thing so he comes for ajar and he goes back with germs so you have to be respectful about other people and then make sure that what happens is you understand that the Hajj is in the spirit and not just in rituals. So this is something which is important. So make sure that you also guard against respiratory infections and uh, make sure that you keep washing your hands uh, every time you get a chance. Now before you do that, I thought I'll just make a list of some of the important things that you may need when, when you travel. So I was just trying to think and saying, okay, what would they need? Try to have an emergency kit, a medical kit with you. So this will be your saving grace. Apart from all the medications that you take and in ample quantities because what happens is the medications that are there in Canada are very uh, extremely extremely uh, quality medications and they are approved by the health authorities. So you may not necessarily get them there. So Saudi Arabia is a very decent country in terms of having good medications because they get everything from the West. But make sure that you have one and a half times of what you may need in case there is a calamity or something gets delayed. Just make sure that you are equipped appropriately in terms of the medications that you carry. Apart from the medications that you carry, uh, you would like to take something that you need every day without having to go to the doctor. For example, carry something for fever. Uh, you could take something called paracetamol or acetaminophen that goes by the name of Tylenol over here. You could take something for pain. Tylenol helps in pain. You could also take ibuprofen. We, we call it Advil uh, very colloquially. You could take something for constipation because when you have high protein diet, especially when you have less water, the IMSAC is something that you, all of you will experience and then hemorrhoids are very common. So you should not say like, how much Ibadah did you do? I did so much of Ibadah that I had hemorrhoids. You wouldn't want to come and tell your friends that. So this is something which is very important. So make sure that you take something for constipation like Sanacot. It's easily available over the counter. Take something for vomiting because invariably everybody is going to have some nausea and vomiting when the flight takes off or when you've had some strange food to eat. Though it's delicious, it may not be what your body needs. So you may need that. So take some gravol and then whilst I'm measuring, uh, mentioning nausea, you may have what is known as gastroesophageal reflux disease. So you may have some acidity. So you could take some renitidine, uh, you know, which is simply available over the counter at 75 milligrams, but your dose would be about 150 milligrams. So two in the morning and two at night. You may want to take something uh, like that. Also, don't forget to take some surgical supplies, very simple surgical supplies. For example, the long band-aids and the dot band-aids just to stop bleeding or some small infections and things like that. Also take some uh, alcohol swipes and Purell. Purell could be your best friend. So this is something which is very important because it will kill germs even before you transmit them. And take a multipurpose ointment, something like polysporin. For example, if you have an infection or if you have a bug bite or things like that, this would help you. Also, it would be not unwise to take a good antibiotic eye drop because what happens is you can easily get conjunctivitis in those cases, a pink eye as we call it. So just try to take a small kind of thing. So this is extremely important. When you pa pack your passport, when you pack your ID card, when you pack your paraphernalia, your medications, everything else, have an emergency kit because this could be your life-saving things. And don't forget your travel insurance. This is extremely very, uh, this is important. Now, so you made this preparation and then you've said, okay, I'm all set. What happens as you kind of progress? The most important thing is that when you go to the airport, check everything and make sure that, uh, that you have all these things at all times with you. Because what happens is you've packed everything and then you say yes and then you put it in your carry-on baggage. And then you have your first you know, rise in blood sugar or drop in blood sugar when you're on the flight. And then you're scrambling to find out if you could get you know, some help. 
So the most important thing is all this should be carried in your hand carry or in the cabin baggage if you don't want to be seen with it at all times, you want to do that. So that's the most important thing. And also make sure that when, uh, when, you, are at the, uh, when, when you are kind of uh, on the flight, make sure that you know who you're traveling with. So what happens is when you help someone, you never know who will be helping you. It's always the team that wins. And make sure that you understand the limitations of, of your body and your mind. The second most important thing is try to get a very good picture of the entire pilgrimage. Try to get a picture of the entire pilgrimage. You don't want to go there. And some people, the first time they've gone for Hajj. I remember when I went for my Hajj, my mom, God bless her, that took me by the hand. She asked me to close my eyes and I went over there. And then she said, open, open your eyes when you see the Kaaba. The, the, the beautiful, glorious sight was so overwhelming that I did not know what to ask. And she quickly whispered, just pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whatever dua you ask for should be granted. Because you're like a greedy child, right? You see the celestial Kaaba in front of you and you do not know what to ask. So what happens, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because we have some Hajj fanatics. When they land over there, they say, from tonight, I'm just going to start doing Ibadah. And then what happens is they just go to the Kaaba, they go here, they do this, and they say like, okay, till what time did, were you awake? How many rakahs did you do? How many tawafs did you do? Like this, their competition and competition and competition. And then they indulge in over kind of, uh, uh, you know, over worship. And what happens is that by the time Hajj comes, everybody's kind of very relaxed and the actual horses come out. The champs come out because they know why they have come for, they know what they have come to do and then the champs come out because the champs always come out during the last stretch. They show their talent and they show their strength and, they, and their stamina during the last stretch. And when they look at these guys who've burned themselves out in the first eight days, they're looking for them and they're saying, Ana taban. And then they're giving you stones to go through on their behalf. They're saying, do this on my behalf, do this on my behalf. So you wouldn't want an underprepared Hajj. So most important, you have to be very, very careful that you understand the whole pilgrimage. Try and do your ibadah. If they are not on Hajj, if they are on non-Hajj days, try to do it in the evening hours. Because try to understand Saudi Arabia is a very hot country. So the most important uh, complications that you could get, even if you were like Tarzan, if you're built like Tarzan, what happens is you could have dehydration and you could have sunburns. And don't take these too lightly. I saw a severe, severe case of sunburn just 48 hours in my clinic. It was horrible. She, she had just gone on July 1st, on Canada Day, she had just gone to a water park and just, just put her legs out. She had covered the rest of her body. I think she was in a bikini or something. She had covered the, rest, the, re the remaining part of her body. But what happened was she had just put her legs out and there were severe burns. She could hardly walk. So when I'm saying that, the most important thing that you should also carry is carry very good sunscreen. Carry sunscreen that's at least 45 SPF. 15 SPF is what they say, but I don't believe that. At least carry 45 SPF. Get it from a good company and make sure that it's non-oily so that you're not kind of, you know, slippery and you're swarthy and then sweaty all over the place. So take some things and carry good bottled water at all times, at all times, at all times. That is second nature to you. And at times when you are allowed, carry an umbrella. Because sometimes in Hajj you're not allowed to wear hats and all those kind of things. Carry an umbrella and choose the non-peak hours to do your ibadah because it's just going to be studied and it's just and then be careful and be respectful of other people you know people who uh, usually love to do uh, all their tawafs with with indonesians because they're all short and then they move in a group so they feel this is the safest group to go with so they just follow them and some people are extremely extremely they use their intelligence to do to do tawaf be careful of those people like i know one guy he was a sheikh from india so I'm from India. So I remember this guy very clearly. So what, he's a sheikh from India. So what happened was he wanted to kiss the black stone. So what he did was he followed two huge Sudanese people. He followed two Sudanese males and, and being from the African descent, they were huge. So as they walked, they were throwing five people this side and five people this side. And this guy was just taking a walk in between. 
So he went and went and went and then when they, when, when what happened was when they cleared the crowd at the black stone and when these tall guys bent down to kiss the stone, they did this. So he thought that this was the right opportunity and he put his neck inside. He said, now I have followed them. This is the best way to kiss the black stone. He did that. Those guys got so upset that they just squeezed his neck. So I was there and then they knew that, you know, like uh, we were also doing our Hajj. And then they said, there's some guy from that city where I belong to. He's fainted and then he needs medical help. And when I, when I went over there, it was this, uh, our Sheikh. And that's because he was not careful and then he just took things for granted. So don't take things for granted because unexpected things can happen over there. So play safe, be calm, be spiritual, be mentally very prepared for any calamity and you will be, uh, you will be very happy. So these are some of the things over there. And then the other thing is that when people are doing Hajj, they are very focused on eating outside. Be careful where you eat. For example, I knew a family when everybody is shouting Allahumma Labbaik, the kids are shouting Allahumma Albaik. So they just want, because Albaik is something which is extremely, extremely very uh, unique and very special to all of us when you go to Jeddah, right? There are certain cities where you get it and you don't get it in others. Like you won't get Albaik in Dama, for example. So make sure that it is fresh and make sure that you can only handle as much as you can, you, you can handle. Don't overeat because what happens is it could be oily, it could be gassy and then what happens is you could get a severe attack of gastritis and that may not be in your best, best interest. So this is something which is very important. So what happens is you've gone to Mina, you have then proceeded to Arafah the day of the actual Hajj. Alhamdulillah, I'm very happy for you because what has happened is you've lasted that until then. So you have made sure that you've taken all these precautions and then Carry a very good friend. Don't, there's no need of carrying handkerchiefs and all those things. Of course, you'll be in Arham. Make sure you carry masks. Because any time where you feel that you are in the midst of people who are coughing, wear a mask. It's not prohibited. In fact, you're doing everybody and yourself a great favor. Buy some masks. Buy 20, 30. Distribute it to those people. And don't think that you're giving away those things free. What you're actually and intelligently doing is that you are getting yourself Prevent it. You're preventing yourself from getting those infections. So make sure that you carry some masks. Keep washing your hands as if it's the most important thing in the world. And make sure when you cough that you at least do this. So these are small, small precautions. It may look silly, but you do not know how important it is. Because people don't do that. And eat, eat like how the Holy Prophet ﷺ advised us. Eat within limits. Three parts. The first part is for air, the second part is for water, and only one third is for food. If you do that, you're going to be fine. So you finished Arafah, and then what happens is then you proceed towards Muzdalifah. Just be careful how you sleep and where you sleep, and then protect yourself. Make sure that you're appropriately clothed, because that's when you'll be uh, you know, exposed to uh, you know, um, bug bites and mosquitoes and, and so on and so forth. And then what happens is you come back and then what, you, you have to shave your heads, right? And this is where most of us are very careless because you will find those people over there, like people, you know, calling you, yalla, 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 everybody wants to call you because they want to shave your heads. So be very careful. I would say it would be wiser to take your own blades if you're allowed, but you're on a flight, they may not allow you. At least go to places that are designated as safe. Because you don't want to come back with horrible, horrible scalp, fungal and bacterial infections. Very difficult to treat if you don't treat this very seriously, my dear friends. I've seen tons of cases. They come back with bizarre rashes over here, scratching and things like that. And they're just the skin infections are going up to their necks and then to their shoulders and things like that. Be very careful. Take your own sweet time, investigate who this person is, make sure that you're not in a hurry, like people are waiting for you, they're saying, okay, we'll be here, you just finish shaving your uh, scalp and then come back to us. Don't be in a hurry, just investigate the barber, make sure that he's using a new blade, make sure that he has adequate, ant uh, adequate antiseptic supplies and make sure that you are safe. So this is something which is very important. And then you have to do the rummy, right? You have to do rummy, be very careful. Be respectful of other people's things. It should not be like, okay, I was very good at cricket and I was very good at uh, these kind of things. So using your stones and instead of throwing the stones at shaitan, 
you're kind of throwing it at your friends' heads. And then you come back, how much you bothered? You do look at me like I got all the stones on my head. So you're just kind of bombarding everybody's bald heads with the rummy stones. So be very careful. Stay out of harm's way and everything else. So these are some of the, uh, you know, some of the practical precautions that you can take. One of the mistakes that I've seen when I was uh, in Saudi Arabia was that they, the, the way they do their sai. The doctor would have told them, oh, you've got high cholesterol, uh, you're overweight, so you have to exercise. Then suddenly they get in a brain wave. They're saying that I've come over here, I've come to Hajj. So, you know, the zamzam was done, it came up this way by running between these two uh, things, Safa and Marwa, why can't I do it? Don't try it for heaven's sake, don't try it. For Allah's sake, don't try it. Be very calm, understand the physical fitness of your body and do it accordingly. Because what happens is you can get very severe muscle spasms. You could have rupture of your tendo achilles, the small tendon that connects your calf muscle to your heel. There have been very kind of things, especially if you're in a deconditioned state. You can get tendo achilles uh, muscle ruptures. You could get worsening arthritis. Very important because you're without footwear, you could get what is called plantar fasciitis, a very severe stinging pain in your soles. Extremely difficult to manage immediately, so you may spoil the rest of your ibadah. So take it easy, go in the name of Allah, go in peace, make sure that you complete the whole circuit. Remember at the end of your day, you, you never do hajj with your body only, you do it with your mind and you do it with niyyah. After your niyyah, you want to do it with mind because that is how you, uh, you can achieve a maximum kind of benefit uh, and, and, and you, you're planning for a quality hajj. And most important thing is after you are done your hajj, people go very relaxed. Don't do that. Because it is at that time that you are very vulnerable for infections. Because you see there are people who have been on the edge. They have had some, in, they have some, they have had some medical conditions. They have had uh, uh, infections that they have kind of acquired. Their bodies are not strong enough to process this infection, so they become extremely, extremely vulnerable carriers of those infections and then they pass this on to other people. So that is when you have to be extremely careful because what happens is that you don't want to come back to Canada with a pneumonia. You don't want to come back to Canada with a virus you don't understand that you've picked up, some exotic virus that you've, come, you've, you've, you've picked up somewhere. You don't want to come back to Canada with a severe skin disease that you don't understand. So that's the reason why after the Hajj, though you are a very accomplished kind of newborn, as they call it spiritually, you have to make sure that you're, uh, you're still guarding for all those infections, especially at airports. So there is a special kind of condition called infections in returning travelers. This is a huge, huge dilemma for infectious disease personnel who treat diseases. So this is some, these are some of the things that you have to uh, guard against. I wish you all the best. And at any time you have any questions or any, any uh, doubts, uh, it's been a privilege to uh, be involved over here. I'm very sorry that, uh, I mean, it was at very short notice, but I'm still grateful to Dr. Uh, Mr. Bashir that he uh, allowed us to kind of commune as a group so that we could share some information. Uh, he has my contact particulars. And then if you are really interested, we do travel uh, uh, advisories and we do travel uh, medicine all the time. I just practice across the street. You're more than welcome. And I've told him that if there is any need, we could even do a Hajj clinic for, for all of you. Uh, and I wish you all the best. So to summarize, go back to your immunization cards. It's not, uh, it's, it's not too late. Get your IDs, get your prescription slips, get your, uh, make sure that you have a prescription written down and make sure that whatever you're carrying is in your hand carry. One more thing is don't kind of uh, neglect traveler's diarrhea because uh, when are you leaving, Brother Brashid? How many days do you have? August 2nd. August 2nd. So how many days do you have from tonight to August 2nd, approximately? Three weeks. Okay, three weeks. So traveler's diarrhea is very easy to treat. So the vaccine for that is as follows. You just have to take two doses. The first dose is two weeks prior to departure. So if you have three weeks, you still have, 
you know, you, you still have three weeks left. So take the first dose uh, two weeks before you go and the second dose is one week before you go. So very smart move and then what you could do is also carry some broad spectrum antibiotic like amoxicillin just in case you get, uh, you know, uh, streptococcal uh, stroke throats and things like that. So this is, these, are some of the, uh, these are some of my suggestions. I hope uh, it was helpful. And then uh, I was speaking to Brother Bashir over here to say that in case something else is uh, required, uh, uh, it would be a privilege and an honor to come back to uh, share, um, you know, any, uh, any information that you need. And then we could also have a qu question and answer session at that time. So I'm very grateful uh, to be a part of a fantastic uh, um, pilgrimage over here. And I wish you all the best. Yes, sir? Who is their location? Who? Just across the street, Brother Bashir.